All right, welcome. In this series of videos, I'm going to start talking about the theory of computing. And I'm going to start in this video talking about uh, alphabets and languages, uh, the core foundational topics that we're going to need to start talking about computing. So we'll start with the idea of an alphabet as just being a set of characters. And there's not really much that differentiates an alphabet from any other set other than that we specify that the elements of the set are characters, whatever that might be. Um, we are pretty uh, agnostic about what kind of characters you might be interested in using. So here are some example alphabets, some that you might be familiar with. The first two here I call uh, sigma uppercase and sigma lowercase as the, the uh, uppercase and lowercase uh, letters that we're used to in the English language. And then I've also included, since I've been using sigma here, uh, and then I will use gamma here uh, as the set of the Greek uh, letters um, where uh, the uh, modern English alphabet originates from um, centuries ago. But then I've also included here some other possible um, symbol sets. So symbols is another word for characters that we might use here. And in DNA, we have sort of found that uh, the way that the DNA molecule is formed is out of specific kinds of chemicals that we treat as symbols. And so we can treat DNA as being a long sequence of G's, A's, T's, and C's, those representing specific chemicals in that sequence. And then uh, another uh, alphabet that we might be interested in here is the decimal alphabet or the set of numerals that we use to make numbers. Um, and we're going to see down here below that the standard alphabet that we're actually going to use in this, uh, in this series is going to be the binary alphabet or just the set of 0 and 1. Uh, but every once in a while we will switch into another uh, alphabet just for convenience, just to show that we're not restricted to that. Um, and then as you've probably noticed already, that when we're naming our alphabets, at least by convention, we typically use cap capital Greek letters and sigma is the most common one used. So we, I will be using sigma a lot throughout this series. So if we're talking about uh, sets of characters, well, what we use characters to build are usually strings. In fact, what's on the this slide here are a bunch of strings formed out of some of those alphabets. Those strings are words that we recognize as English words that we can read. Um, and so this is foundational in uh, both uh, uh, our theory of computing and in our theory of maybe linguistics. Um, but this idea of a string is just going to be a sequence of characters. Um, most of the sequences that, I don't emphasize it here, but most of the sequences that we are concerned with are finite. That's, that's something that's also true. All the sequences we see on this screen, on this slide here, are all finite in size. Um, and so if we were going to talk about an infinite string, we usually call it an infinite string to emphasize that we mean something a little bit different than our common sense. Uh, but we can look at a couple of example strings here. So again, if our default alphabet is going to be the uh, binary alphabet, then we might be looking at binary strings like this first one here, 01101110. We might treat that as a, uh, a number, a binary number. That's common for us. Um, but because it's got the leading zero there and there's eight of them, this might be a byte, maybe it represents a character in ASCII, maybe it represents something else. Um, and we're going to be somewhat agnostic about that in this uh, theory of computing series. We're going to be just focusing on it as a string of zeros and ones. What it's being used for is mostly for our purposes abstracted away. We're just going to treat it as a series of ones and zeros and what are we going to do to it when we process it. Uh, so a couple of other examples, we might have this string A, B, A, C, A, A as a string from this uh, set gamma, uh, A, B, and C being the only characters there. Uh, and then again, using the DNA one, I've, I've just formed this string Gattaca. I've, that's the name of a, a movie about uh, genetics. Um, and they used, uh, they took this, the, the name or they got the name by forming uh, a word basically out of the uh, the letters that you can get from a DNA string. So uh, these are just some examples of strings over alphabets um, that we might use. Again, we're going to probably stick to binary strings for most of our discussions in this series. Uh, okay, well, there's a special string out there uh, called the empty string. Um, we'll probably be using uh, epsilon for the empty string uh, mostly in this course, although depending on where you're looking, what other uh, text you might be reading, you might see it uh, also 
uh, a lambda. These, this is a lowercase lambda. Uh, the only thing special about the empty string is it's empty. It has no characters in it. Its length is zero. That's why we give it a special symbol. Um, otherwise, writing it is it usually is empty. There's nothing to see or, or write. Um, another interesting idea that we're going to uh, work with here is the idea of uh, what we'll call the Cleany closure, uh, where uh, Cleany is uh, this gentleman here who uh, it is named after, um, uh, and he uh, invented or, or first described it. Um, the Cleany closure is if you take some alphabet here, say sigma, and we use the star operator to represent this closure of the set, it's going to be the set of all the strings over the alphabet sigma. So if we're talking about uh, sigma is a binary set, then we're going to get all of the strings over the binary alphabet 0 and 1. So you'll notice here I've started listing them, but there are infinite of these strings. So uh, uh, that's why I have the ellipses at the end there. Uh, but we've got the uh, empty string is showing up first because the empty string is technically in all sigma stars and all uh, it will always show up as a string over any alphabet that you might have because it's also po it's always possible for us to have a string of length zero uh, but then i start listing the strings of length one in my simplified alphabet binary alphabet we only have zero and one and then zero 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 one one zero and one one are the four strings of length uh, two and then there will be a bunch of, of uh, strings of length three as we keep growing we will keep getting uh, uh, longer and longer strings okay so now that we've talked about alphabets and strings over the alphabets we can also introduce the idea of a language and the language is really what we're going to be studying in uh, this series so a language is going to be a set of strings over an alphabet and we've kind of already seen one of those which is sigma star sigma star the set of all the strings over an alphabet is a language it's sometimes considered a trivial language because it contains every possible string okay these languages that we're more interested in are going to be ones that have a limited number of strings so for instance let's take a look at this very first language it's simple it's language zero i've got it named here um, it has the string ep epsilon, the empty string. It's got uh, 0 and 1, and it's got 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. These are all the strings of length 0, length 1, and length 2. So we might say that another way to describe uh, language 0 would be to say that these are all the string strings uh, out of our, our uh, over our alphabet here, sigma, or uh, from the set sigma star, that are of length 2 or less. What we've noticed about that is that there are a finite number of strings in this language, and um, that makes it a very special kind of language. Most languages do not have a finite number of strings. Most of the interesting ones, at least, are going to have uh, an infinite number of uh, strings in them. Um, and so this one's very special. It's kind of simple because it's a finite length language, and we'll see that uh, there, there might be properties about uh, finite sized languages that are important later on. Now, because finite sized languages are typically simpler, we tend to focus on, as I mentioned, the infinite sized languages. So here's another one, language one. This one, let's read this out. This is using sort of uh, our, our set builder notation. So let's remember how this works. This is saying language one is gonna be the set of all strings W from the set sigma star so if we only had that part none of this extra bit here we would just say language one is sigma star it's all the strings from sigma star but then we read this vertical bar usually meaning such that or all the strings from sigma star such that they have some property and then usually we list some other property over here about them that tells us which strings we're selecting and specifically we're selecting here those strings that it's the strings w that have an even length so we're saying here not all the strings, just the ones that have even length. So looking up above at this first set here, we would notice the empty string does count because its length is zero, but not zero and one. It would include zero, 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 one, 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 zero, and one, one, but it would also include all the other infinite strings larger than length two that are of even length. So this is an infinite size language with infinite strings in it, all the even length ones. It doesn't have all the strings in it because it doesn't have the odd length ones in it, but it's still infinite because it has um, no end or no. there's no upper limit on the size. 
Okay, let's look at another language here. This is a language that's also imposing some, some type of ordering on our strings. This one says zero to the n. What do we mean by that? When we're talking about strings, when we raise it to an exponent like that, we mean concatenation. So what we really mean here are n zeros in a row and then n ones in a row. So what this language is saying is we want strings that start with a bunch of zeros and then end with a bunch of ones and we want the number of zeros and the number of ones to always be the same. So that's a special special kind of string, I guess, with equal numbers of zeros and ones in this pattern. Okay, we'll see that this is a special language uh, in a few uh, videos. Okay, and the next one here, uh, this one has a similar idea as the one up there. This one's saying we want the numbers of zeros and ones to be the same. This one's saying I want more zeros than ones, so slightly different. But also this language doesn't impose the structure. This one says all my zeros come first and then all my ones. This one's not saying that. This is just saying any w, any binary string w, but we want the, the ones that have more zeros than ones. Again, one thing we might want to start thinking is, uh, are these languages easier or harder for us to determine? For instance, if you were just given a string and I said, hey, is it in this language or not? Would you be able to determine that easily or more difficult? I think uh, uh, language two might be a little bit easier than language three, at least for me personally, because here, if it was out of order, I could immediately say that's out of order. And I might be able to you know, count the zeros and count the ones pretty easily. Uh, whereas if you give me this one, they're all out of order. I won't be able to tell until I count every single zero and one. I'm like, well, maybe that's the same work. Maybe it's, maybe it's harder. I don't know. But that's the thing I want you to start thinking about is how difficult is it for us to compute these. So here's another one, uh, a palindrome. Do you remember what a palindrome is? So a palindrome is a string that is read forwards and backwards. It, it reads the same, like the name auto. Auto, O-T-T-O, -T -T -O, that's spelled forward and backwards the same way. Okay, so that's a special kind of string. Can you detect those? Okay, that's what this one says. All the strings from sigma uh, star, all the strings, the binary strings that can be read the same forwards and backwards, like 0110 one, zero, or 1100111. Zero, zero, one, one. That's read forward and backwards the same way. Um, Okay, again, thinking, is that harder than the ones we've talked? I'm, I, I've kind of put them in order of maybe getting harder. I don't know if that's strictly what, what I've uh, got here, but that's what was intended. So the next one says, okay, I only want strings of zeros, so no one's allowed. That seems easy. But the number of zeros that you have has to be a perfect square. So you could have zero because that would be zero squared. You could have one because that would be one squared. Um, you can't have two or three, but you can have four because that would be two squared, right? You can have nine because that would be three squared and so on. So can you pick out perfect squares? Is there some way that you can do that? So again, is that harder than palindromes? Okay. And then language six. Okay. This one's interesting. Well, now we've got strings for the most part we haven't been treating these strings as numbers but now we are so what w w is still a binary string but now it's saying w is a prime number so we're going to look at that string we're going to think of it as a number not just some zeros and ones like this string or just some zeros you know stuck together with some ones we're going to look at it treat it as a binary number and then we're going to check is it prime that one seems definitely in the same ballpark of, as this n squared. We kind of need to do some math to maybe run a little algorithm, something like that, to figure out if this is actually true to detect if strings are in this language or not. And so I've kind of emphasized here one of the uh, important things about languages, the things that we're going to be focused on in this series, is we're going to be asking, hey, Ha first, is this string in this language? That's the central question we're going to be looking at. We're being given some W, some string W, and we'll be given some language, and the question will be, is W in that language or not? And then the secondary question, the reason we're focusing on strings and languages and whether they're in there is because what we're trying to figure out is how hard is it to determine that it's a member of the language or not? So. And, and we're gonna give some rules about what that means. We're gonna compute using some, some computational rules 
whether a string is in a language or not and then measure how hard was it to do that computation how many steps did we have to take carry out for instance to determine if this is, is uh, an easy or a hard thing to compute okay so now that we started talking about languages just like strings have been a special kind of string the empty string there's going to be a special kind of language called the empty language which is uh, there's de denoted two ways one is we can use this symbol here which is the symbol for the empty set because the empty language a language is a set so it's just an empty set so we'll just you borrow that terminology or that symbology that we already have or we sometimes just write it as an empty a literal empty set we'll just put open and close set braces and say look there's nothing inside there um, so those are just two ways that are pretty equivalent in the literature that you can you will see and again it's just the the empty set the language that has zero strings in it so i've already emphasized this but the language membership problem we can treat this as a computational problem or an information processing problem central to computing that's why we're studying the theory of computing here so this problem the language membership problem is the problem of detecting if a string w is in the language l or not so given some computer program ideally that's what we're thinking of uh, we're going to give it the w as the input and it has to tell us yes or no is it in this language so one of the reasons we focused on this is because a lot of problems real world problems real computational problems real information processing problems uh, specifically classification problems like text classification you know reading text and determining if it's a word or not speech classification listening to speech and and uh producing a transcript of it uh, or image classification looking at a picture and determining if it is uh, you know a dog or a cat or an apple or an orange or something like that all of these problems in the, at least at a high abstract level a high level of the theory of computing can be reduced to this language membership problem we can imagine that the, the set of all the images that are pictures of dogs or all the images that are pictures of cats, we can think of that as a language. And we can think of the inputs, the strings that we're inputting them as being the images themselves and us asking the question, is this image one that belongs to the set of dogs? Or is this one that belongs to the set of cats? Or the same thing with text. Is this a word that belongs to the the language of English or is this a word that belongs to the language of Spanish or French or some other language that we we might be uh, classifying so these problems which are real world problems that we might use in AI or some other tools are problems that we wanted to solve and we want to know how hard they are and on a theoretical level we can use the language membership problem to start talking about that and and in a way what this does is it allows us to take all these real world problems that are have all these different details um, that make them different you know is this audio is this text is this an image what what are we even looking at how is it encoded and and abstract away all those details and instead say hey all of them really just work in a computer at some level all of them change all of that business all that data into just ones and zeros a big long string of ones and zeros and if we can solve these problems just thinking about ones and zeros then maybe we can solve this problem for all the domains that we would be using it in and that's the power of the theory of computing which is uh, uh, saving us from reinventing the wheel allowing us to reuse what has been done before to solve more and more problems and so that's the goal that's the goal of this series so thanks a lot for joining me in this first video and I'll see you in that next video